Hello. Sorry for my drowned rat um, appearance today, but I'm I'm back, back at home again. Um, I'm going to say two words in a made-up language, or I'm going to say the same word in two different ways in a made-up language, and I want you to see whether you can tell anything about what's being said. So these are completely made-up words. If they resemble existing words, then that's just a coincidence. Um, but the words are ingaltako, ingaltako. What you might have got from that is that a question is being asked. Um, I, I never know how well these audience participation things are going to go down because different people have different intuitions about different things. Um, so you might, you know, that might not have seemed like a question at all. But you might have got that a yes-no question is being asked in both cases. The first one uses uh, an intonation pattern that's common in American English and the second one uses an intonation pattern that's common in British English for yes-no questions. So the American English pattern is... Um, uh, do you have any apples? Whereas the British English pattern is, do you have any apples? And that difference alone highlights that intonation is not just something that humans naturally do. There are not universal intonation patterns. These things differ from language to language and from dialect to dialect. This is a feature of languages and dialects that we don't necessarily think about very often, and we don't really even need it. Um, so normally if you're reading a book with dialogue in it, the intonation isn't marked apart from maybe an italicised word here and there. And in a language like Spanish, intonation might be the only thing that separates a question from a statement. And in that, in that case, you would mark that with punctuation. But even in English, intonation is clearly meaningful. It can convey information about how the speaker's feeling. It can tell you what kind of response they're expecting. And it can draw your attention to which parts of what they're saying are important. It's important to say that English is not a tonal language in the same way that a language like Mandarin is. Um, in, in tonal languages, the tone is a feature of the syllable and it's tied to a particular syllable of a particular word. So if you say the tone, you know, if you say the wrong tone, then you've said the wrong word. In the same way as if you say the wrong phoneme, you said the wrong word in English. Um, this is not, you know, th this tone system does not exist in English. Intonation is a more... I suppose a more nebulous thing. Um, a sentence can be slotted into a particular intonation pattern, but the tone is not a feature of a given word or a given syllable in English. It's just a, a sort of pattern that sentences can be slotted into. So how do these binary question patterns work in American and British English? The fact that it's a yes, no question isn't the only thing that affects the intonation pattern. The pattern also depends on which parts of the sentence are important. So new information is marked using intonation so that the, uh, the, the listener knows this is the bit of the sentence you should pay attention to. For the speakers I've heard, the American intonation pattern by default starts to raise in pitch on the last stress syllable of the sentence, and it raises until the end of the sentence. And that changes if an earlier word in the sentence is salient or important for some reason. Uh, so if it's introducing new information. Go and get Lucy. Is she in the garden? She's not in the garden. OK, well, is Josh in the garden? In the first question, the pitch stays the same until we hit the first syllable of the word garden, which is the last stressed syllable in the sentence. And then the pitch gets higher until the sentence is finished after that point. Our second question is identical to the first, except we're now talking about Josh rather than Lucy. Josh is the new piece of information being added. In this case, the pitch stays the same until we hit the word Josh, uh, which is the salient word in this question, and from there it rises towards the end of the sentence. So the point at which the intonation starts to change, the kind of one of the nodes in the intonation pattern, correlates with a stressed syllable of an important word. In the British English pattern, there's a kind of rise in the early part of the question, and then that peaks on the last stressed syllable and then falls, sometimes with a little flick up at the end. Just like in the American pattern, if there's an important word earlier in the sentence, the peak will jump to the last stressed syllable in that word. Go and get Lucy. Is she in the garden? No, she's not in the garden. Okay, well, is Josh in the garden? Even though these systems are different, they operate on a similar principle. There's a shift in intonation on the last stressed syllable of the sentence or on a stressed syllable in a salient word. As somebody who looks at older stages of a language, it would be really interesting if it were possible to reconstruct how intonation worked in the past, even if just to get a better sense of what it might be like to listen to somebody talking from back then. But to do that would require an understanding of how it works, how it changes over time, and how resistant it is to outside influence. 
firstly, why is intonation even a feature of language to begin with? Um, it, it clearly carries some kind of information that's not carried by the words we say, or it supplements the information carried by the words we say somehow. Um, so why, why don't we just talk flatly and encode that information using extra words or bits added onto the ends of words instead? Um, I suppose, I mean, I, I don't know, I can't answer that, but I suppose you could, you could guess that the answer was something like um, it requires less time if you kind of layer different strategies of encoding information on top of each other. Um, one of those strategies would be uh, using words and then one of those strategies would be using intonation and that way you can convey more information in the same amount of time, I suppose. But, but the exact functions of intonation differ from language to language. So the, the exact things that it's used to encode differ from language to language. So um, in Spanish, as I said, intonation can be the only thing that distinguishes a question from a statement. Um, in English, that can be the case, but most of the time uh, a question is marked with a change in um, word order. But alongside that change in word order, there's also uh, an intonation pattern which marks out as a question. Intonation also carries information about your attitude to what you're saying. So what's the difference in meaning between I don't like it there and I don't like it there. It's hard to describe, but I would say I don't like it there sounds more kind of emphatic. So like almost like I don't like it there and I'm determined not to go there. Whereas the second one sounds more permissive, um, sort of, I don't like it there, but I'll go if I have to. And of course, these, these extra bits are just my interpretation. The I'll go if I have to, or the, the I won't go. These are just things I've, I've um, taken the intonation to imply. But of course, that, that, that all depends on context as well. So intonation doesn't necessarily carry um, explicit information in the same way the words do. So it seems like intonation can be used to show how the speaker feels about what they're saying um, and it can mark what kind of utterance you're producing and it draws attention to which bits are important. There are different ways of analysing intonation that rely on the actual pitches people are using and also the contour, the way the pitch changes. Um, and the one I've seen used in recent literature is the Toby system, which is apparently fairly adaptable across different languages, although my, you know, I haven't necessarily read a load of papers on languages that aren't English. Um, it looks like this and it records a few different things. It records boundary tones, pitch accents and phrase accents. The boundary tones are the tones around the edges of a phrase. Um, for example, what pitch you finish at. Pitch accents are those peaks of intonation during the sentence that mark important words. And phrase accents are the changes in pitch that happen between those points. A more easily readable way of doing it, if you're able to, is just a line following the pitch contour of the speech. And there are pieces of software that will basically produce this for you automatically. Um, and, and these lines are a lot easier for a human to look at and read. But I imagine the Toby system is better if you're using a computer to analyse a load of intonation data because it breaks it down into parts that the computer can easily understand. Um, and I'm hoping to do a bit of this analysis myself at some point, so I'm sure I will soon find out how much of a pain in the arse it is. So it's possible to describe the entire phonology that a person uses when they're speaking. Um, maybe not every single detail, but it's possible to do a very in-depth description of somebody's phonology. Is it possible to do the same thing for somebody's intonation patterns? So every, you know, every single thing from um, how they make declarative statements to how they ask yes-no questions and rhetorical questions to uh, you know, how they call out to someone who's far away. Um, and how their relationship with what they're saying affects these things. And more importantly, from my perspective, is it possible to reconstruct a historical version of this? Is it possible to reconstruct a historical system of intonation? I have a few ideas about how this kind of thing might be done, and I'm hoping to look into it at some point. But because these things have never been encoded in written English as standard, you'd be relying entirely on comparative evidence comparing modern dialects and modern intonation patterns. And that means you'd have to assess how well comparative evidence can actually inform us about these things. So, for example, is it useful to assess the difference between standard English and high German, or have these two modern languages affected each other to the point that all useful comparative potential is gone? You know, has television caused these two intonation systems to become very similar to each other where they weren't otherwise? 
this paper delves a bit into question intonation in Icelandic and it goes into detail about the different types of questions. So about polar questions, yes, no questions, WH questions, which start with words like who, what, when, rhetorical questions, um, and so on. And it uses the Toby system and also provides a line showing the pitch contour so it's, it's easy enough to read. Um, these are the pitch contours that they give for a WH question, like where are the potatoes? The one at the top is described as the typical contour for a question like this. Um, and I'm, I'm not very confident in my Icelandic pronunciation, and I try not to pronounce things if I don't think I'll make a, uh, at least a reasonable attempt at it. But the word order is more or less the same as in English, and if you were to slot the English sentence into this intonation pattern, it would be, where are the potatoes? Which really doesn't sound that unnatural in my accent. I think there are certain situations where that intonation pattern would sound normal and others where it would sound abnormal, um, but I'm finding it difficult to qualify that, so I might just add a slide for you to pause on uh, when, I, when I edit this. So if we slotted an Old English sentence into this intonation pattern, uh, we'll replace potatoes with a native Northwestern European fruit like apples, um, it would sound like this. apple. I'm not suggesting that's the actual intonation an Old English speaker would have used for that sentence, just that it seems to fall within the range of more than one modern Germanic language. But again, the Icelandic and British English patterns could be a result of more recent interactions between those two cultures. Um, it could be the result of television. There could be any number of confounding factors that stop that being accurate for Old English. English and Icelandic um, and the majority of Germanic languages have pitch accent which is post-lexical and that's what I described earlier, you know, you slot a sentence into the, uh, the intonation pattern um, <coughs> particular words don't have their own intonation patterns built in but Swedish and Norwegian are two examples of Germanic languages that have what's called lexical pitch accent which is um, pitch accent which is attached to particular words um, and it can even make the difference between two words. It's not quite the same as tone in Mandarin, but it's more similar to that than English pitch accent is. I'll link to a good video in the description that goes into more detail. I think one example he uses is the difference between Tomten and Tomten. Correct me if that wasn't a very good attempt at a grave accent. Um, and this lexical pitch accent is what gives Norwegian and Swedish their kind of weird up and down sound that a lot of foreigners notice when they listen to the languages. I think Old English must have had post-lexical pitch accent in the same way that modern English does and most other Germanic languages do. Um, just because uh, the, the small amount of literature I've read on Norwegian and Swedish pitch accent suggests that it was, it, it has developed since the Viking Age. So it's probably a more recent development in those languages and not something that's been lost in the other Germanic languages. Um, but I, I would love to... Um, research this some more so if, if I ever um, if I ever get around to doing that then I'll definitely um, I'll definitely talk to you a bit more about it but until then I hope this was uh, I hope this was interesting thank you very much indeed for watching and I will talk to you next time